Thank you, everyone, for coming. It's really great to see you. You are the hardcore research cognoscenti of nursing and health services and workforce research. So we're really thrilled to see you. And it's a special personal pleasure, as well as a real professional honour to welcome Linda Aiken back to King's because she has been here several times before, not least to be the recipient of an honorary doctorate, which is the highest mm -hmm. distinction that the college can award. So we're really grateful that you accepted our invitation to that and also to give this talk, which is a little bit different from perhaps some of the talks that you've given in the past here and elsewhere because it has more of a personal touch. And I'm especially <laughs> thrilled because I was just totting it up actually, and you reminded me just now, Linda, that it's over 30 years since we actually first met. And Linda has been a huge mentor, so generous in her collaborations on research, and as a role model for me and, and many others. So, I mean, I owe a lot of my career to Linda. And so it really is a wonderful treat and, you know, opportunity for me to thank you for that. And all that you've done for the profession, I think, as we're going to hear as this conversation goes along, there will be an opportunity as well for um, questions at the end. So. We're going to talk probably until about six-ish and then open it up to the floor. But really, it is such a treat to have you here, Linda. And Thank you. You never quite know where research is going to take you. So I was just wondering whether we should tell people, should we tell them what we were doing last night? Yes, because we just talked about it before we came in this room. Yeah. I totally <laughs> understand it after you said we've known each other for 30 years. Yeah. Take it away. Okay, so last <laughs> night, guess where we went? Now, this is going to be quite interesting. You know, given that we're both scholars and academics and so forth, where do you think we went on a Sunday night? It's quite far away. It's up, I'll give you a clue. It's up near the Olympic Park. And it has something to do with music. Yes! <laughs> well done, Danny <laughs> Kelly, you get the prize. <laughs> So there we are, we are like singing and dancing to ABBA, <laughs> the celebration of the century. And it, you never know when you're going to have to turn your hand to these different skills. So I, I love the fact that, you know, we can celebrate mm -hmm. their career and now we're going to celebrate yours, Linda. Well, we said we need avatars of ourselves of 30 years ago. That's <laughs> what we mentioned when we walked in here. So watch that space. <laughs> Great. So just to remind you about Linda's absolutely stunning and stellar career, she is Professor of Nursing and Sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. She's director, founding director of the Center for Health Outcomes and Policy Research, as well as being a senior fellow of the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics at Penn. She is an NIH-funded investigator, I think that's the understatement of the year, she has won millions of dollars and still has millions of dollars, so I'm hoping some of that will just flick over here, um, by osmosis in the course of the talk, in grants um, from not just the US but other international bodies as well. She's published over 400 scientific papers, most of them in very high impact journals, as well as co-authored and edited a number of books. She's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, which is the you know most prestigious academy for health services research in the US, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's also a former president of the American Academy of Nursing itself. And this gives us great pleasure, an honorary international fellow of the Royal College of Nursing in the UK. So that's brilliant. And in recognition of our highly impactful research, Linda received the Gustav Leinhardt Award from the National Academy of Medicine, which is basically the highest distinction the National Academy can offer. 
the individual Codman Award from the Joint Commission for Accreditation of Hospitals and Healthcare Associations and Organizations in the US. And that's like a kind of super regulator in, in the US. The Christian Reinman Prize from the International Council of Nurses and the Episteme and Researcher Hall of Fame Awards from Sigma Theta Tau International. She co-directs many studies, but amongst which the European Commission-funded Magnet for Europe is, uh, stand, stands out. And its initiative to redesign healthcare workplaces to improve clinician well-being and patient outcomes in 65 hospitals in six European countries. So we're very proud to have you here with us today, Linda. Thank you very much. Yeah. It was great to have a chance to meet some of you briefly. We really have an international audience. Yeah, I know. Both from Singapore, from Brazil, from other places in addition to England. So, so happy to be here. Thanks. Thanks, Linda. So for the benefit of the audience, Linda, could you just tell us a little bit about your background and some of the highlights in your career? Um, okay, well, I should say that I have been studying hospitals in England for 25 years, along with Anne Murray. And so I know something about the hospitals here and have been very interested in them, as well as doing international research elsewhere. As Anne Murray says, I'm a nurse with a strong background in clinical nursing, uh, a sociologist, and a health services and policy researcher would be how I describe myself. So I have kind of three career paths that I have been pursuing kind of simultaneously and trying to connect the dots across all three of those areas. Um, I, no one in my family was in healthcare, but I read a lot when I was young. And I read a lot about medicine and nursing, you know, mostly from historical uh, uh, fiction and <clears throat> the Cherry Ames book. That's kind of an American book of a student nurse going through uh, their education. Uh, and I wanted to be a nurse, but I wanted to go to the university more. And uh, when I was of university age, nursing in the US was only just becoming a university subject. And <clears throat> some of the programs were like what I would call quasi-university subjects in that they <clears throat> gave a degree in nursing, but nursing wasn't really part of the university and totally integrated across all the disciplines in the university. So when I was young, my number one priority was to go to a great university. And I mention that because I think it's so important for the future of nursing that we have nursing in great universities like King's and you know other famous universities because there are a lot of people with career aspirations like mine that decided early on they wanted to do something for their whole lives and make an impact. And having a university education from a great university is how you start. And so I happen to have the good fortune, you know, careers are partly, you know, affected by serendipity, and they're, you know, partly affected by the choices that you made. And it happened that the university I really wanted to go to, I grew up in Florida in the U.S., and the University of Florida was one of the top national public universities. And that's where I wanted to go. I didn't want to go to Harvard or Yale. I want to go to the University of Florida. And they had just started a bachelor nursing program and a whole health science center that was completely new, that had the uh, original uh, culture of a health science center where it's multidisciplinary and all the disciplines are working together with the goal of providing excellent patient care. So just as an example, there were no disciplinary titles on anybody's name tag. You know, everyone was working together and so it wasn't a hierarchy at all. And um, there were really uh, creative and um, amazing people that could foresee the future of healthcare. 
And so I had great mentors there and an interdisciplinary education with a focus on research and an inquiry, because that was the whole idea. If we have nursing in the university, then it has to be an evidence-based discipline. And it's about care, but it's about care from the evidence base. And so that's kind of where I started my career. And uh, because the nursing school was very much integrated with the teaching hospital and health science center, our um, role models were always clinical nurses and some physicians and others as well. So it's very much a clinical focus where we wanted to be great clinicians, but with that sort of evidence base. And so early in my career, I wanted to be a great clinician. So I spent a, a long, not a long time, but I spent about 10 years uh, providing direct care. Uh, I was interested always in acute care in hospitals and my clinical area was open heart surgery, and this was the beginning of open heart surgery. Uh, very interesting, a friend of mine just had an atrial septic defect closed, and I did it completely through the femoral artery. There's no incision, but of course, when this was beginning and I was a nurse, people were, you know, had their chest broken and they were open this far and they were on the heart lung machine and so forth. And there was so much we didn't know. So I got very interested in doing clinical research really from the beginning because I could see that people, some people were dying and we didn't know why. We had actually a pretty high death rate in the early years. This is really when, to date myself, our physicians were operating on dogs some days and humans some days. Like this was the beginning. We had no intensive care units. Uh, I became really interested in the topic of the RCN conference tomorrow, which is on safe nurse staffing, because here we were doing these um, highly advanced medical procedures. But when I graduated from this really good nursing school, I thought I was a good nurse for a beginning nurse. Uh, I was one of two nurses on a whole unit that had open heart surgery patients in no ICUs. And so I was involved in really the development and trying to modernize care delivery so that it matched the acuity levels of the patients at the time. So of course, in order to have an ICU, you have to have nurses. You can't possibly have an ICU without nurses. But you know, originally, when I asked for an ICU, the idea was, OK, you could have a four bed ward. And maybe you could have an aide in there. And I said, no, that's not going to cut it because the acuity level of these patients is so high. Well, hospitals at the time weren't staffing at that level. They just weren't. And so that was the whole beginning of really intensive nurse staffing in acute care hospitals. Um, my first observation in those days was that there was something wrong with the care delivery system because you couldn't possibly take care of these patients that were undergoing these highly technical, uh, high mortality kind of procedures with the kind of staffing that we had and with the kind of work environment we have, which were very chaotic, uh, not good communication. Uh, well, a lot of well-meaning clinicians, but not set up to really have a professional team. And so that's when I got interested in this idea of studying the work environment. That led me into sociology, because that work environment is all about complex organizations. Uh, that led me to get my PhD in sociology, which kind of led me into health services research, which really is really the study of the delivery of healthcare. And with my special interest, the impact of nurses in the care delivery system and how the situational context of their practice affects their outcomes for patients and their own outcomes in terms of burnout, uh, turnover, commitment to a career. And then that led me eventually into health policy because if you want to reorganize things, obviously you have to start dealing with policies and how care is paid for because then you're dealing at a big macro level. So that was kind of my 
brief uh, tour to the University of Pennsylvania where I set up a health policy research center, interdisciplinary center, because the study of complex organization is by definition interdisciplinary. So because I was a sociology, it had a strong input from my sociology colleagues there, from economists, and then we moved more and more into health policy, which is what we're going to be discussing at the RCM. Great, Linda, but you also skipped a little chapter, which was when you were one of the founders of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation program. I mean, in yes. philanthropy as well. Right, well, um, the decisions that I made in life, you know, change as you're presented with different uh, ideas. I thought I was going to, what I really wanted to be when I started out, after I got a sense of what the healthcare system was about, I wanted to be the chief nurse in the hospital and the dean of a nursing school so that everything was run on the basis of science that students learned and got to practice what they learned. And so I want to run the whole show, mm -hmm. but I was only in my 20s. So I figured, okay, I've got to get a PhD to skip, you know, this age hierarchy that was alive and well in nursing, it still is uh, for that matter. Uh, so I got my PhD in sociology, but by doing that, then I met these famous sociologists, researchers. And the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is Johnson & Johnson, the Band-Aids, uh, the founder of it died and left his estate to this foundation to be invested in improving health care. And so the foundation staff went to the famous sociologists and said, who are you training that could be on our founding staff? So that was the serendipity of a big part of my education because when I was a pretty much new PhD, I'd had a career already in publications in nursing, but then I got my PhD, but I was a young PhD, like some of you are soon to get your PhDs. and. So I got an offer from a foundation, which is a different path, you know, because I thought I would be a tenure track, you know, professor going down that well-tried path. And then this big foundation that had more money to spend than I ever dreamed of, not only had to spend, but they, they were mandated to spend it. And they were interested in funding um, de big demonstrations to find solutions to the healthcare problems that I was concerned about. So I figured, okay, I'm going to just go down this path less traveled and see if it works out. And it turned out that the people that went to the foundation in those early years were all sort of quasi academics like me. And it turned out not to just be a foundation as you would think of it today that gives away money. It, they were academics that wanted to know, you know, do these interventions work? So it was a great opportunity to ask everybody in the country, what are your ideas about how to fix healthcare and make it better? Then we put multiple millions of dollars behind their ideas and, you know, obviously people have a lot of ideas. We're not short on ideas about how to fix things. Sometimes we're short on the where, where I thought to test some of these ideas. So that's what that foundation did. And then I created a program of research where we rigorously evaluated those multi-site interventions. And I and my colleague that worked with me in research, Robert Blunden, published so much, both of us were new PhDs when we went there, after we'd been there for 13 years without ever being an assistant professor anywhere, we were both hired in Ivy League universities as endowed professors because it was, you know, a whole science-based operation. And so, Amory's right, that was a very formative uh, period for me because we were collaborating with government so uh, we said, okay, we have $50 million to spend trying to improve care for the dying. Okay, we've been looking at England and they have something called hospice. And so we think that the US would benefit from bringing hospital, hospice to the US. So we paid for a pilot 
uh, the U.S. government paid for the insurance to pay all the providers taking care of the dying patients. I did the evaluation, and we convinced our Medicare program to start paying for hospice in the U.S. because it obviously worked. So we were doing big things like that. So when I went to the University of Pennsylvania, I couldn't like get my head around doing a small study of 100 people because we'd already been studying millions of patients at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So I put on my thinking cap to say, okay, how at the university could I just change roles? And part of my role would be raising all the money that I had to give away at the foundation. Can I raise the money, but do those same big things at the University of Pennsylvania that we did at the foundation connecting rigorous research with them. And so that's what I've really been doing for the past, past 30 years. I figured out how to do it, raise millions of dollars from mostly the NIH. More recently, in the last 15 years, a lot of it from the European Commission, but do these same big, big demonstrations that do research on trying to put evidence behind what are the problems we really face and what might be the good solutions, but also test some solutions. So that's kind of what I've been about, which is a really fun thing to do. Fun and a lot of hard work. Like <laughs> yes. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it does require a lot of collaboration. And I mean, you've painted a picture with a kind of golden thread, you know, running through mm -hmm. your career. and. I'm just wondering, you know, about the sort of methodological um, elements of, of this research, because you've got these really big gun data sets uh, that, you're, that you're collecting. If you could just give us a flavour of the different kinds of methodologies that you've been using, because um, we have a division of methodologies and Glenn's our glorious leader in that. Um, just to kind of mm -hmm. provide us with a little bit of background mm -hmm. on that, to see how sure. the building blocks have evolved mm -hmm. over time. Well, the, the building block was originally my interest informed by my clinical practice. There was something wrong with the organizational context of care. Okay, so I took that clinical observation. Everything I've ever done has been informed by clinical practice. So I've always had one foot in clinical practice and many, you know, not so much directly practicing anymore, but practicing through uh, maintaining really close working relationships with real hospitals uh, and with colleagues that are actually doing this. And then my sociological background served me well, as it turned out, I was my kind of inclination when I chose the PhD turned out to be right. I looked first at PhD programs in nursing and they were they weren't what I wanted because at the time they were very qualitative, they were very small studies. I was interested in fixing the healthcare system where nurses were practicing. And so sociology was a better, you know, fit for me. And so what I got from sociology was a theoretical perspective which was really critical to the success of our research and the methods. So just first, you know, how sociology helped me uh, define the questions. If you're interested in changing the service context of practice, then the N, you know, the number of subjects you're studying are the organizations and not all the people that are working in them. So I couldn't survey all of you in this room and really make headway figuring out how to redesign the organizations you work in because you probably work in a lot of different organizations, et cetera. And so this, the theory of complex uh, organizations in sociology would suggest that you have to study the participants in organizations in order to know what's really happening in them. And you can no longer think of the subjects as individuals, but you have to think of them as the organization. So the breakthrough, I know this is probably a little murky, 
but people were having trouble showing what the outcomes of nursing care were because they were thinking, okay, you have one nurse taking care of a patient. How do you prove that what that nurse does makes a difference in that patient's outcomes? Well, it's pretty hard because there are a lot of other things that are going on. There are a lot of different nurses taking care of every patient. There are physicians and a lot of other providers. The patients are at a different level of illness and so forth. And so the sociology of complex organizations suggested that if I wanted to study this, I couldn't really study individual characteristics of providers. I had to reconceptualize them as the properties of institutions. As I was interested in changing something. So I was interested in studying what can you change about healthcare? You cannot change very well the size of a hospital, whether it's a teaching hospital, whether it takes care of poor people or rich people, all those things, you, they're just givens. You can't really change them. I wanted to know what it is about nursing that you could learn by looking at this. And so the breakthrough we had in terms of creating what is modifiable is to observe that everything about hospital nursing is different. The staffing, the educational mix, the skill mix, meaning the number of RNs, the proportion of RNs, everything about nursing differs by hospital, which suggests that all those things are potentially modifiable. Because even within the same country like England, if you study any of your hospitals, you'll see, and you have a national health service even, and you have huge variation across all these things. So these, to be studied, they can't really be individuals. You have to think of them as the properties of the organization. So staffing is a property of a hospital that's modifiable. The education of nurses is a property of a hospital. It's also a characteristic of an individual. But from the point of view of looking at what impact it has on patient outcome, it's a property of a hospital. And it's modifiable because the hospital, through selective recruitment, through training, can modify the educational mix of nurses. They can modify the proportion of nurses in nursing service personnel. So. This was a scientific breakthrough that we made that helped the whole field because then we could study looking at these things as organizational properties, how different organizations had different proportions of baccalaureate nurses, for example, or had different levels of staffing, or had a higher proportion of RNs and so forth. So that allowed us through studying hundreds of organizations, which is the sociological way to do this, as you're studying the organizational context. So you're really not studying nurses anymore, doctors. You're studying the organizations. You have to have a lot of them. So going back to the end, you know, you have to have 100 or 200 or 300 or 1,000 organizations to study to learn something about them. Now, each of those organizations could have a thousand nurses working in them. You know, so if you're studying a thousand hospitals and they have a thousand nurses, all of a sudden, and they're taking care of a million patients each, all of a sudden you're into mammoth, you know, entities to study. Well, the only way you can really study that is through a survey research, because you can never collect your own primary data. And B, you couldn't ever really collect the outcomes data from patients. So you have to do it in a way that you use the existing information in a national health system that's already collected to be able to study the patient outcomes. And so that's where the sociological methods come in, survey research, and also the ideology or the, I should say, theoretical framework of sociology is if you want to study complex organizations, you could do like business does. We have a very famous business school at Penn, and they often study the elites, you know, the CEOs, the CFOs, to figure out what's happening with the hospital. But the sociological theory would say, no, you have to study the participants in the organization. So we study the doctors and the nurses that are providing care in the organizations 
not because we were studying them per se, but we were using them as informants about what's happening in the organization. So we do the research through survey research. So we survey lots of doctors and nurses and they ask them, who is your employer? And so then we take all the people, say we're doing this in London, we're studying all the hospitals in London, we survey, make it simple, all the nurses in London through some kind of sampling process. We ask them where they work. And so everybody that tells us they work for King's Hospital, we aggregate them together. And then we create a mean for that hospital of nurses education, staffing, the skill mix. We can look at doctors in the same way. We can look at their qualifications. And so that, that uses that sociological theory and the, the methods of sociology survey research to study the organizational context in a way that had never been studied before. And then uses um, hierarchical modeling because basically you have providers that are nested in organizations. You have patients that are nested in organizations. Uh, if you're interested in patient outcomes, you know most of the reasons why patients die in a hospital has to do with how sick they are when they come come in, not anything we do. So if you wanted to figure out what is the impact of nursing, you have to have a very good uh, control of the severity of illness of the patients, and you could only get that if you had detailed information on the tens of thousands of patients that were in the hospital. So you control for, do they have hypertension? So you can see all this is adding up to something you can never do through observational research. You could never even do it through primary data collection. We tried that in one of our first studies. Um, I don't want to go on too long, but to say also if you want to study something like organizations, you can't really do a randomized trial very easily of an intervention because, as you know, you can't talk hospitals into doing something. That's a big problem. You know, we all have a lot of good ideas, but hospitals won't do them. So you have to look for opportunities to study hospitals that make something change, that you're not making change, but it's changing for another reason. So early in the AIDS epidemic, they became a big topic for us to study, not because we were AIDS researchers. We had a big epidemic in the US of AIDS. We had all these desperately ill people that were hospitalized, especially in the AIDS epicenters of the big cities. There were no cures. There were no treatments and really nursing care to try to keep people alive and keep them from dying of their symptoms until they recovered from that episode was all you could do. And so nursing became the dominant thing that we could provide to AIDS patients. And so a lot of hospitals in the US kind of intuitively said to nurses who obviously could catch this disease by taking care of patients, okay, we're going to give you these units and you organize them however you want to. And of course, if you ever say that to nurses, then they organize them in the way that nurses have always wanted to organize them. And they did that in dedicated AIDS units. So that gave us a natural experiment to study a big organizational redesign. So we're always looking for those kinds of things. And again, that's kind of a sociological idea. So you, you're studying the organization and not the people, you're using the people as informants because they're participants in the organization. And then you take these multivariate modeling um, <clears throat> statistical platforms that sociology has developed. It's not biostatistics because we're not studying the details of the patients. It's social statistics, which is different model. Uh, and so all of our work is really based on social statistics and studying organizations. And we were the first group to really do that. There were some publications in health services research about why it is that hospitals have uh, different outcomes. And they did some of this uh, modeling work, but they chose things that you couldn't change, like the size of hospitals and whether they were high technology hospitals. And you could find 
if you read the papers carefully in the Lancet and the New England Journal, which is, by the way, one of the things you have to do, is you have to read, 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 and read out of your field to get these ideas. Uh, they would usually have nursing in their models somewhere if they were studying hospital outcomes. But when you got to the discussion, they never discussed nursing. They never made anything out of it. It was like it was a control and a model, but nothing to be focused on. As a nurse, I said, that's crazy because these variations in nursing are just, you could just tell in the models are accounting for more of the variation than some of the things they were focusing on. And a lot of the things they were focusing on, you couldn't change anyway. So that's kind of how we started doing a different kind of research. And by the way, when I went to Penn, I also had a big PhD training program. And so, so far I've trained 100 PhDs. They were all trained in this method that was new. They're all now, many of them full professors with research programs of their own, training a whole new cohort. So we not only developed from really scratch based upon sociological theory and methods, this new way of studying hospital outcomes, but we've educated really a whole field of people, not only in the US, but also internationally. I mean, that's fabulous, Linda. I mean, you've taken care of several of the other questions mm -hmm. about how your program evolved and uh, really, you know, what can a sociologist contribute to the whole kind of workforce arena? I mean, it's, it's a, do you think that big quant sociology is a particularly American <laughs> phenomenon? I mean, it's quite close to demography in some ways, isn't it? Right, and actually my um, <clears throat> PhD is also in demography. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. So that, I was always like quantitatively inclined. That's why I didn't really like the, uh, it wasn't for me the more um, qualitative PhD programs at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and demography, the three main foci of demography are mortality, fertility, and migration. Okay, that's us, right? Mm. That's what we do. Mm. That, that's the nursing workforce, yeah. basically, if you kind of spin it out. Mm. So, um, yes, so that's where that highly quantitative thing came from. Now, um, you can't do this alone. And this is like a very important, you know, element if you want to do this kind of research. You have to have a team, and it has to be a multidisciplinary team. And... <clears throat> One of the things I found out early on, I found out this being at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, really, and took it to Penn, is if you have resources and you ask a smart person in any other field, will they work with you? They all say yes. You know, often we think as nurses, people that are important in their own disciplines, they're not going to care about a, a nursing problem. It's, it's not true. And especially if you have the resources to offer them, because sociologists and statisticians and psychologists and economists, they all have their theories, but they don't really have any examples of primary research to test their theories on. That's why they use secondary data a lot. So what we have in nursing is we have a huge amount of data in healthcare and real life problems. And what I found out is a sociologist can test almost anything they care about by focusing on nursing. The same thing in social statistics. We had at Penn world-class statisticians working with us um, on really testing their new theories on how you could use something called template matching so, you know, you take a million patients, and in order to ask a question about what works best for patients, you match them so that everything about the patients are exactly the same, except the intervention you want to look at. They didn't have good ways to test that because they didn't have databases, they didn't have a question. So one of the things I learned at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, by giving out money, when I said, I have money, do you have ideas? Everybody says, yes, 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 we have ideas. And then when I got the pen and I said, I have NIH money, do you want to work on this? They said, yes, yes, yes. And so um, lots of nurses don't really realize that. And also, 
the problems that we work on, we work on them every day. And sometimes we lose sight of the fact that they're really interesting human problems. And these other faculty that are also interested in these phenomena just immediately see how important these things are. So we underestimate how interesting our work is. And what I found in my career, I've never had anybody ever turn me down that I asked them to work with us. Never. And so that's something that you ought to take with you because you really, I don't think you can do any kind of meaningful research without having collaborators from other disciplines. That's a really important thing because, you know, especially we know something that these folks don't know because we're clinicians. We spent a lot of our lives learning how to be good clinicians and learning caregiving. So even those of us who have a PhD in another area, so we're always dual people. You know, we know two things. They know one thing. But often they know their one thing better than we've had time to develop because, you know, it takes years and years to become an expert in um, multivariate statistics. So you need these people, you know, on your team. Mm -hmm. And that that's how we built the real powerhouse team at Penn. And they really started pretty much working for us all the time as I thought, well, what I would have to do is have to have plead with these professors at Penn. I would have to, you know, go to their offices. No, as Anne-Marie knows from, you know, being at Penn, they all come to our offices. They have their office in the nursing school. I mean, they just like made this shit. They didn't give up other things they were doing. But I'm making a point that people in other fields find nursing and healthcare um, just as interesting as we do, but just from a different theoretical point of view. If you put it all together, then you can really make progress in research. Mm. And you've spoken a bit about some of the breakthroughs that you've had as well in kind of methodology and building programs, Linda. And we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, influencing policy in a minute. But I just wondered if you'd like to say something about the gaps in evidence. You know, where are the gaps that need to be plugged? Have you got any thoughts on that? Yes, a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the biggest gap we have is that we're studying the problem over and over again, but we're not really testing the solutions with the same level of science. And the re net result of that is that all of, I mean, the service sector can't not respond. You know, we, you know, pretty much internationally have a nursing shortage now. Well, you can't tell all the hospitals Oh, we're working on it. We're, we're, we're studying it. You know, we're studying it more and more. We know more of the details. We know that nurses are burnt out and this, that, and the other thing. And they have to do something in practice. And so they are doing things. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've learned is if you let the healthcare system respond on their own, they often make decisions that we as nurses no, are not the right ones and will haunt us for decades because they have people that are not clinicians and not nurses making these big decisions about how to address something like you have in England where you don't have enough nurses. And so don't get me started on this path, but your government, you know, in their wisdom has come up with some ideas about how to solve this that nurses could have told them and did tell them from the beginning were not a solution like the nurse associate. Sorry if I offend anybody in the room, but having building a whole new group of providers that are not nurses is not the way to solve England's probably plenty of research showing that it wouldn't solve it. But anyway, went down that path and so now you have them. Uh, the same thing in the U.S. Uh, they're doing things, but <clears throat> even though as clinicians we all like to see, say we're using evidence-based practice, like you wouldn't dream of giving an antibiotic if you didn't know the science behind it, but that doesn't transfer to the things we do in service delivery. We do a lot of things in service delivery have never been tested, and even we've done, we do a lot of them that have already shown not to work. 
So I think the single biggest thing that we have to do at this point is that we have to start testing solutions. And we have to hold our healthcare systems accountable that if they decide they're going to do something, that they have to collaborate with us to allow us to try to test it. Not that they necessarily have to test it, but we also have to make resources available. You know, research is not cheap, it costs money. And so we have to, in the same way we fund biomedical research, we have to have some funding source to fund these big things. I mean, I happen to be in a country where we've convinced them that they have to fund these health service delivery things. But most other countries I work in, that's kind of not the case. So it's hard to do. So um, in, in our work with the EU, we kind of went down this path of saying, OK, well, we have a lot of knowledge about the impact of nursing on outcomes, but not a whole lot of, it, lot of it comes from Europe. And so governments in Europe won't use it because they say, oh, that comes from North America. That's not us. So we got the EU. Anne-Marie was a part of this uh, very important study called RN Forecast, which was a $4 million, a 4 million euro project funded by the European Commission that involved um, 12 countries in Europe and three other countries, major countries that the EU allowed us to include that are huge countries in and of themselves, like China, mainland China and South Africa. Uh, and we spent four years on a highly rigorous study where we took a large number of hospitals in all these countries and we recruited nurses, a lot of nurses from them as informants about what was going on in those hospitals. We took countries that had a data system that would enable you to do risk adjusted mortality on the patients. And so then we published over 100 papers showing exactly how this research that had been done in other places like Australia and North America was exactly the same when you tested in Europe. Like we found in the US that every one patient added to a nurse's workload in a hospital was associated with a 7% increase in risk adjusted mortality. That was a US finding. We found exactly the same number, that models are exactly the same in nine countries, including England, in Europe. Exactly. And we replicated exactly the impact of having a higher proportion of nurses with a bachelor's degree on reducing mortality. And it was almost the same number. So we were building this science base that said to policymakers, these are generic relationships that there's more similar in what nurses do in countries around the world. There's more similarities in hospitals and how they're organized and operate than there are differences. And these associations are the same. It doesn't matter if you have a national health service or if you have private insurance. Those are details. The generic things are the same. So we did that. And so we said, OK, what is the next big thing we should do? Because we did that descriptive associated work in 30 countries, as Anne-Marie mm -hmm. knows. We did it in Chile. And we, we've worked in almost every continent. And the findings are the same. So we said, what is the next big thing that we should do to advance science, and particularly do something you know, important in healthcare. And so we decided that we had to start testing interventions. And so that was our project that we're working on now called Magnet for Europe, where we took an intervention that over 40 years had a tremendous amount of evidence and was also present in different countries that these organizational theories that actually came from the sociology of complex organizations, that's where the principles of magnet come from, that you have flat organizational structures with transformational leaders, with the people that are closest to the product are engaged in the decisions about the organization. I mean, you've heard these. These are all not new 
ideas for nursing. They've been shown to work at every organization. So Magnet was an intervention that operationalized those um, principles into a manual. And there were, there's been research that shows that hospitals, they could be big or small or rural or urban. If they take the manual and they implement it, they can improve their work environment, improve outcomes. So we convinced the European Commission that this was the most evidence-based organizational innovation that we had in healthcare to do what we were interested in. And so they gave us the money to implement it. And so that's what we're doing now. And we recruited uh, 60 hospitals from six countries in Europe that were willing to volunteer to take the manual and implement it. And we gave these hospitals every resource we could possibly give them to help them do this. We matched them one-to-one -one with a hospital that was already accredited for being a magnet hospital. They'd already done it. And most of them had already done it and be re-accredited re you know, over 20 years. So we had a huge amount of um, experience in every kind of hospital. So we twinned them one-to-one. -one. Uh, we gave them all kinds of technical assistance and so forth. And so we're doing that now. And so we're going to learn, is Magnet an idea? We already know it works in the US. We have plenty of research. Is it a global idea? Or is it a U.S. idea? And so we're finding that at its heart, it's a global idea because the principles, the organizational change are, you know, those things that sociological research has found are common to all complex organizations. The actual intervention in its form is kind of U.S. centric and that creates some barriers for uptake in Europe. But Nevertheless, I think ultimately we're going to find that it's applicable here, but a more um, something that we're now doing in the U.S. So we're looking at U.S. hospitals. So they all say that they have a shortage of nurses in the U.S. We know because we do research on this, there is no shortage of nurses in the U.S. I know this is not the case in Europe. So these are some of the things can vary by different countries. Nursing is one of the most popular career choices in the U.S. Uh, we've done a lot of things that we could talk about, but everybody wants to be a nurse. And we're now training, uh, graduating, almost 190,000 nurses every year, U.S. educated nurses. That is more than twice as many nurses as are reaching retirement age. So we have twice as so Every 10 years, we're adding a million nurses to our workforce. It's all right there. So I say to hospitals, the nursing schools are responded. They've expanded. Our policies to increase the workforce have worked. We can all congratulate ourselves. They're out there, but they don't want to work for you. You have created your own problem. And, you know, so then we study turnover and you can see that many of these hospitals that say they have a shortage and there's nothing that can be done about it it's not their fault they're recruiting hundreds of nurses you know some big hospitals might rec recruit a thousand nurses they lose 30 percent of them in the first year they had them but they couldn't keep them it's like what we call the leaking bucket so they fill up the bucket but all the nurses are leaking out because the work environments and the understaffing is driving them away because they have no work-life balance. They're paid well because this is one of the reasons why a lot of people want to be nurses. My grandson just graduated with a bachelor's degree in nursing. I'm very proud of him. He's an ICU nurse in a magnet hospital. He just started. He makes $88,000 a year and he got a $20,000 signing bonus to work in that hospital for two years. Okay, for a brand new college graduate, that's pretty good, you know, by any standards, I think. I'm not saying that it's too much or anything, but we've kind of solved that problem. But we can still have plenty of nurses, and it's not connected with a nursing shortage in hospitals or nursing homes or home care, because none of those employers are hiring enough nurses. So we we're telling them over and over, you have to hire enough nurses to keep enough nurses. 
And so what they're doing now, getting back to my thing, left alone, what they like to do is tell the U.S. government to train more nurses. Mm -hmm. We already know how to do that. And we've already done it. And it didn't solve their problem. So now they are going back to something we call team nursing. Do you have something called team nursing mm -hmm. here where you, know, you mostly have RNs in roles of supervising lower level people? We, we don't really have that in the U.S. where you have what we call primary nursing where the RNs are providing most of the care. And that's why we have staffing ratios that are around four to one or five to one is where we'd like to keep them because the RNs are providing the care and we have some assistance, but they're really assisting, they're not providing care. Well, the hospital decided that we can't afford, you know, we can't do that anymore. They like to say, because there are not enough people that want to be nurses, that why we, that's why we can't do it. So we keep saying, no, 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 that's not right. But anyway, they're doing it. And so 76% of the staffs of our hospitals now are RNs in the US. They want to take it down to 20 to 40% RNs. Mm -hmm. They're doing it without studying anything. And they say, you know, this, this is going to solve the problem. And so then we take it on ourselves and we have to raise the money ourselves. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, we have some ways to raise it where we can study them now because we do these cohorts. So we never ask hospitals if we can study them. That's also the key to studying hospitals because if you ask hospitals if you can study them and go through their human subjects committees, the ones that are the worst are going to say no thank you, right? So you're not going to really have a representative sample of hospitals to study. So what we do now is about now more and more frequently, about every three years. Right now we're in the field, we're surveying 2 million nurses, in ten, all the nurses in 10 states. This is 30% of our entire health system. So these 2 million nurses are going to tell us about what's going on 30% of our whole health system. We're, so we're going to study thousands of hospitals without ever asking them. And so we're studying the ones that are implementing team nursing. And so what we can say, and the, paper we have pending now is for every 10% decline in the proportion of RNs in these hospitals is associated with a 15% increase in risk-adjusted mortality. They don't want to take it down 10%. They want to take it down 50%. So we're able to show, I mean, it's actually hard because you can only study what exists in reality. So we don't have any hospitals that only have 20% nurses. So you kind of get into modeling, you know, in a way that is a little hard to defend because it doesn't exist in reality, but nevertheless, you have to do it to show if these hospitals really brought this down, we would be having like 10,000 excess hospital deaths for the country every year. And then not only that, but I'm getting to the second thing that I think is under understudied <clears throat> is hospitals think they're saving money through all these things they're doing. And <clears throat> really, that's their main motivation when you get right down to it. They're very financially oriented. Well, we need to have better financial numbers mm -hmm. on what is the impact of the bad things that are happening and the solutions. And so by using these patient data sets, you have a lot of financial information buried in it, which makes them so important. Because length of stay, for example, nurses are driving the length of stay in every country. We found that. So if you have good nurse staffing, you have shorter length of stay. Well, long lengths of stay are costing our countries a lot of money. They're costing the hospitals a lot of money, depending upon how they're reimbursed. So in the U.S., hospitals are paid on a per episode basis. So if they can provide the care at a shorter period of time, they keep more money. So we can show that if they had better nurse staffing, that the cost offsets on saving the length of stay would pay for them hiring the additional nurses. We need more and more of that because they have to be like hit over the head with this because they're used to looking at a balance sheet for today. And they want to know today What's the money coming in and what's the money going out? And they are very reluctant to look over a longer period to evaluate. If I do something today, I'm going to save a lot of money next month. 
can look at it in a different way. So I think, you know, the financial side is a really big part of making the business case that we have to, another big part of it that we have to do. And it's relentless as well, actually, yeah. Linda, you know, because you can make some inroads in some areas and then another kind of iteration of change or wave comes along and seems to kind of pull the rug from underneath you. So you've become very adept at, you know, using your evidence to influence policy. And I'm just wondering whether you've got any tips for us in that department. How, how do you do that? Well, so this is a... Um something that, that I've learned uh, trying to do this. I originally thought that if you showed that people were dying because there are not enough nurses there, then immediately everybody would rush out and, you know, hire more nurses. Uh, but it, it didn't happen. It was like, I mean, the nurses loved it. The doctors loved it. All the clinicians loved it. And um, when we found this association between baccalaureate nurses and lower mortality, I mean, immediately in the U.S., all of our directors of nursing started um, deliberately recruiting nurses with a, a bachelor's degree. I mean, they turned that around. We, we, we were having such a hard time ever getting that into policy. But once the nurse executives saw the evidence, they did it. And so, you know, we've now gone a long way into creating an almost, I think we're up to 70% baccalaureate nurses from like, 30 before we did our research because the nurses changed some of the things that they could. Um, but more and more in all of our countries, healthcare costs so much mm -hmm. and it costs more than any of us can afford. And so that means that the people at the top are mostly financial people because the financial concerns are so great. And so you don't even really have a lot of clinicians any longer in the major decision. So we work on these clinical outcomes, but these are not the things that interest people whose expertise is financial management. So that's one thing focused on it. And they don't read. They don't read scientific journals. And so in order to get anybody to change anything, it's kind of a catch-22. You have to do peer-reviewed research, and you have to show that you can publish it in a, you know, a rigorous journal like the Lancet, so that all your scientific colleagues would say, "Okay, yeah, we believe you. We were skeptical in the beginning, but you got it in the Lancet." And a lot of my physician colleagues say, "Linda, I've never published in the Lancet. I, okay, I believe you now. You've you convinced me." Uh, so <clears throat> they're all brought on board, but still. Policymakers don't read the Lancet. So what do they read to the extent they read it all? The newspapers. And they watch television. I don't even think they look at social media so much, but some of the, you know, their assistants. So how do you get in the news? You really have to publish in these famous journals and then use that as the way to get in the news. So if we ever published in a journal in the American Medical Association, New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, then we spend a lot of time writing press releases. We do a lot of time with the media. So we develop people that are interested in writing on health, and we send them stories. So we write the news release for them, basically. And then we put it out everywhere. So we use these platforms that distribute the news release internationally to every place and the news releases are trying to, you know, we're trying to write for the newspapers. So in the U.S. we say that's for eighth grade reading level. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to take your complicated research. It just took you, you know, your whole life to do and you try to distill it so somebody with an eighth grade education can understand it. And you try to move it out through the journals into the press. And then we use a lot of social media like Facebook and um, X, previously known as Twitter, et cetera, to move all these things out. We write op-eds. And that's the way, ultimately, you get to the policymakers. And um, I used to think that if we produce, I'm a researcher, I try to maintain my objectivity, that if I produced research that other people would use it to convince policymakers, but it turns out to not to be true because nurses are not very good at it. 
And so now we just had to admit to ourselves as researchers, you have to do the whole thing because either clinicians don't know how to use the, you know, they can't translate it. I don't know what it is. And so now I spend a huge amount of my time, literally, you just have to do it, talking to the press all the time. And the hospital, this is the example. So the American Hospital Association does not want to improve nurse staffing. That's the thing they detest the most. I have served on uh, the boards of my state with the hospital association boards. They're the most afraid of any legislation that would make them increase nurse staffing because of, they're afraid of labor and the cost of labor. And so they use, they have a lot of money. They're the deep top, what we call the deep pocket, you know, stakeholders. And so they spend millions of dollars in misinformation to kind of keep these ideas from getting through. So to balance that, you have to spend so much time with the media to make sure that people in the media journalists that have, they have, they're not specialists in healthcare. They have no reason to understand all these arcane things, you know, that we're writing about, you have to educate the media. And I would really say on the issue of nurse staffing that um, we have turned the tide at Penn by pumping so much information out and explaining it to the media that they started out on the side of hospitals saying, the federal government can solve this problem by giving more money to nursing schools to train more nurses. So we kept saying, no. Did you know the rat who million nurses every decade? Did you know this? Did you know that? They say, no. Why do they say there's a shortage? It's because it's in their self-interest that they say that. This is the problem. And so really over the last five years, we have changed the kinds of stories that are coming out of the U.S. press. Mm -hmm. And they are now all on the side of nursing. They are all calling for mandated legislation to set minimum standards for hospital and nursing home staffing. And so we could see that sea change, both through our publications, if you just made that huge investment educating them. Wonderful. Very, very time consuming, but yeah. important. Absolutely, absolutely. And maybe just as a final kind of question before we open it up to the floor, you know, we've got many early career researchers, some perhaps slightly not so early career researchers here, but what advice would you offer our early, our young researchers who are keen to focus in this area, in the workforce kind of area, or indeed just get started with their careers and what should they be thinking about? Well, you have to have a good research question. The research question is so important. And that's one reason why I didn't do my PhD in nursing, because I didn't think nurse researchers were asking important questions that other people wanted the answer, and not that they were important. You have to choose a research question that other people want the answer to, not just something you want the answer to. It's so critical, especially in policy research. So you have to anticipate what the UK government's going to want to know or what is the NHS going to want to know two years from now. And you're going to have to figure out a way to study it so you have the answer when they're ready to hear the answer. So you can't just study what you're interested in and expect to have an impact because you know, what other people want to know the answers to is what guides the funders. That's what they fund, not necessarily some little thing that you are interested in. And it's what the journals want to publish because all the journals want to be cited. And so they want their journals to publish articles on things that people want to know the answers to. So you really have to get a good question. It's so important. You start down and you want a question that will grow with you over your career. So my question, how does the organizational context of healthcare affect patient outcomes? This is my question that I had when I was 24. I have not only built a career around it myself and raised over $100 million, but 
all the people that I have educated with their PhDs have done the same thing. So a hundred other people, plus all the people that weren't even trained by me, we created a whole world out there that are answering that question. And actually, we got a lot of pushback from our nursing school. You know, nurses are not always, and you know, you have to have peer review by, you know, the professors in your own place to make tenure. And so at Penn, as Anne Marie knows, we have this center. Everybody's funded by the NIH, but they're all asking a variation on the question. How does the organizational context affect care? Well, from my point of view, you can study almost everything in health. You can study every population. You can study premature babies. You can study end of life. You can study every kind of institution. You can study primary care. You can study um, social questions like care of the poor. You could study the health of migrants. Yeah, I mean, everything. And so a lot of my junior people would come up for tenure and they would say, how does that work differ from Aikens? Because they're used to the biomedical model where you're studying a drug and somebody gets all the credit for like developing the, um, the uh, immunization, you know, for COVID, which we just got the Nobel Prize for a pen. Okay, so that's a checkoff. Somebody got that, their name's attached to it. Mm -hmm. That's not how this world works. It takes hundreds of people to study different aspects of healthcare delivery. It's not one person's work. And so, you know, it's a different way of looking at things rather than the biomedical model. And so you have to educate your colleagues. Mm -hmm. But um, so you have to have that question. The question has to grow with you because you want to keep building on science. And this is building on your own science and everybody else's science, because this is how you become more productive, how you make a contribution. So you don't want to have a question that you find the answer to it and, and that it's over. And then you have to think of another question, <laughs> right? I mean, it's like common sense when you think about it. But I have so many, essentially nurses, because they've been in practice and they say, I want the answer to this question. It's a very narrow question. And once you find the answer to it, well, where does it go? So you have to think about the, the question. And then, you know, when some of you are finishing your PhDs, and before you try to establish your career, I mean, I think that uh, postdoctoral programs are really essential. There's an opportunity for you to go and work with the best people in the world and to work on things they're already working on. Don't be so attached to your own ideas, but go work on research with somebody else that might take taking a different view. You learn how to do research and then try to take a job where you could create a team. If you go and take a job where you're the only person, you know, you're the researcher for a hospital, you know, it's not going to work. And I know so many of my colleagues. So if you go to a teaching hospital that has a nursing school and a faculty and a university, well, that's a whole nother thing because you can like go out and recruit people to work with you. So, you know, being in a, you can't like start from scratch and you have to have mentors. So I've been very lucky and I've had great mentors all my career. So don't, don't do it alone and think big. You gotta think big and read. You, have, I can't really say, you know, any. You have to read outside of nursing. And the way I get really my best ideas for research is I, you know, read in healthcare and I look at, you know, what are the headline studies that other people are doing in health services research. And then always nursing's left out of them, always. Mm -hmm. And so then you go in and you replicate their study, but with nursing in it, and you show that whatever they found was really not the main finding, that it was really nursing that was driving patient satisfaction. So, you know, that's how I get a lot of ideas, like what other people think are important to study in health service delivery, and then you bring the nursing side in. 
sounds a perfect point to actually open up the floor to the audience and get some questions going, but that's just an amazing tour de force. Linda, thank you so much. Um, there we have a question up on the right hand And happy to have any questions. It doesn't have to be anything I talked about or <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've got two questions, actually. One of them... Can you uh, just say who you are? Uh, yes, yeah, I'm Josh, uh, academic at Southbank University. Um, so my first question was in relation to how you think AI may impact re health research in general. Um, and then the second one, a little bit more... Is that AI? Yeah, AI. Mm -hmm. Second one, more American focused. So I, my best friend that I met when I was working at Guy's now works in New Orleans and their hospital became unionized last week. And what, you, what your thoughts are on a possible trend of unionization across American hospitals. So what was the second part besides the AI? About trend of unionization. Oh, unionization. Yeah. Okay. Well, AI and you know, the related kind of things uh, to AI, which I would kind of put in the same bucket, uh, you know, don't mind, like our capacity that we learned fully well in COVID, that we had the capacity to do a lot of things remotely. And so, you know, the issue of using that kind of technology for nursing, does that help solve some of our problem if you let nurses work from home or whatever? And some of the common ways we're using in the U.S. is monitoring. So you have people off site that are in the ICUs monitoring. Or the new idea is nurses off site are doing admissions and discharges. They think that's going to reduce the number of nurses they'll need on the inpatient side. And the same thing with AI and other technologies. I mean, I think AI, none of us know, <laughs> you know what's going to happen with AI. But it's artificial intelligence, this is. And so it certainly has a lot of potential. And I'm hoping that it's going to help nursing on the very burdensome aspect of record keeping, for one thing, that we find both doctors and nurses are just drowning in you know, our current way of collecting information through these big platforms like Epic, where everybody's got to type in all this kind of stuff. And whatever you're typing in is you realize it's not really the critical things you'd like to say and very time consuming and all that kind of stuff. But um, I've been reading more widely on technology, including AI. And this is what I take from some of the findings of other researchers outside of healthcare, that technology and including AI, broadly speaking, It can substitute for some kind of workers, especially in the industrial context where you have assembly lines. I mean, we've seen, you know, how we need fewer and fewer workers to do things that can, you know, be mechanized. But they're pointing out that people that work in uh, human services, it's not at all clear that any of the technology or AI that we currently have is going to substitute for people that are at the human interface. But what it does is it could really improve the outcomes for patients because it could improve the safety of care. But they point out one thing that I think is very important for nursing when they even make this application, but when I'm reading, I make the application I think it's going to further expand nurses scope of practice is what I think is going to happen. This is what technology through time has done. I have my historian here, uh, but that's my read on technology. It's never substituted for nurses. It's only expanded their scope of practice. And so it means that the care is better and you can take care of more and more complicated patients safely, but you have to have more and more nurses. So if your purpose is, and being interested in AI or some of these other things as a substitute for nurses, I think it's kind of, I, I don't see it yet. And, you know, we've been in this technology revolution for a long time, and I can't think of a single technology that is substituted for a single nurse. And we've been heavily into it for a long time. Um, AI, if it only could crack this, you know, um, data processing kind of thing, you know, it, it could be good, but again, 
we have a plenty of things for nurses to do. They, we, their scope of practice is so great now they can't get to it, which is, you know, all of our um, research on missed care and things left undone. We can show everywhere that, you know, half the things that nurses say are really needed, they, they can't even get to. So even if you improve their productivity, they're, they're going to expand out. So that, that, that's my take, but you know, who, who's to say, I think, the most positive thing is I think it could improve patient outcomes. I think it could make nurses more efficient, but I kind of agree with these people that have looked at this longer than I have. It's gonna just expand the scope of nurses practice and responsibility. Mm -hmm. So you're not gonna have fewer of them, you're gonna have more of them. What do you think? Um, so, uh, yeah, I can see, so uh, guys have just started to use Epic Big, bigger system. I think there's definitely, um, in terms of service delivery and efficiency, there are going to be some big changes. And um, I've got a particular interest in genetics and AI and how that can modify healthcare to make sure it's mm -hmm. more direct. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's still mm -hmm. a big movement for us to make in that direction. Yeah, I've used it myself in some things. Uh, those of you who have to write abstracts all the time, you know, like certain things, it's really good. Like you write an abstract and you think you have a thousand words and oh, then you read the instructions for the journal and you realize you only have to have 300 words. You put that whole thing into some of these, you know, chat things and it rewrites it for you and you're thinking you were making every word count, but you know, really it takes what you've already provided the whole science and the everything and it's just condensing. And I think, you know, those, some of those programs do that really well. Yeah, I did that with my research, yeah. with my PhD, and it was <laughs> much more specific than I, yeah. I ever could have been. So, you know, yeah. yeah, but I had to think up the whole, I had to do the study. I had to, have, I did all the main part of the work, and it's only like the condensing of it. So mm. it saves me some time, but I'm not sure it's revolutionary in a certain sense. Mm. Thank you. So. Oh, gosh. Right, so we've got one here. Yes. Then one behind, and then Andreas, and then oh no, you've got the yeah, okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Marion. I uh, work in global health, and I'm a nurse. I thought it was oh. Marion. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm interested in your insights into why nurses and nursing. Hold it up a little closer. I'm interested in yeah. your insights into why nurses and nursing in the UK are not political and are not heard <laughs> in the political sphere. Yeah, I couldn't really hear the translation. Not, nurses in global globally are not political and not heard in the political sphere. And oh, yes. Why? And then what can we do about it? Well, nurses are not very strategic. You know, maybe uh, it's our educational system that, you know, it's not broad enough. Uh, maybe it's the conflict between our focus on an individual and trying to do everything you can for an individual patient that unless you happen to have some different training in public health, you don't think about population health so much. I don't know if that, but I, I'll just give you an example that I'm going to use tomorrow. So remember back, I think it was in 2014 when your quality uh, mm. commission nice recommended before the NHS slap them down is how I would say, yeah. uh, that they ought to move to a minimum staffing ratio in hospitals and the NHS of nurses should not take care of more than eight patients each. Well, there was just hue and cry out of nursing and the RCN and everything about, this is the worst thing we've ever heard. No, we won't do it. And while nurses are like fighting against it, you know, the NHS has brushed it away anyway. but from our own data that Anne Marie and I were collecting at the time, a third of all the hospitals in the NHS would have had to improve their staffing if you had accepted that. So that's what I mean about strategic. So like thinking, well, it's not perfect, but is it better? And what if we got that? Then we'd finally, you know, have gotten acceptance of the idea that there's this probably a safe standard out there. And then over time, you know, you could argue that the standards got to improve because the acuity, I mean, you see where I'm going with it? So it's just at every step of the way, 
you know, nurses are not very strategic. Our unions uh, are the only ones that are really seriously working on ratios in the U.S., but they're not strategic because they're trying to put everything in the law that they've always wanted to get back to hospitals for doing. They want to they want them to pay. They want to penalize these hospitals that, that have been treating nurses so bad. They want to have financial penalties on these hospitals. You know, so they want to put all this in legislation. Not strategic. You know, the legislators don't really want to penalize hospitals. They're paying for hospitals. <laughs> you know, you, you take something that doesn't require a penalty. So I keep telling the unions. You know, in the U.S., these hospitals are licensed. They can't operate without a license. The biggest teeth that you have, the government will say, if you don't staff at this level, you lose your license. You don't have to penalize anybody. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm, you know, it's, it's strategy. It's thinking through get, and talking to some other stakeholders outside of nursing. This is what all my friends tell me. You've got to go talk to some people that even outside of healthcare. Some talk to some of these stakeholders. Like in our world, it would be like the CVS and the Walgreens that have now started these nurse clinics, and mostly they sell drugs and other you know stuff, groceries sometimes. But now they have a nurse. Well, now because they hire a nurse to give immunizations, all of a sudden they realize the national company like CVS, it costs them a different amount to operate in every state because the Scope of practice laws are different in every state, and all of a sudden it's of interest to them, and then they go after it. So it's you know we're we're sort of isolated in our bubble, and it's hard to be strategic unless you get the lay of the land. I guess I would say we we have to challenge ourselves, and and also this is a very big thing, and and I know it goes on in your country as well as ours. Nurses don't speak with one voice. Mm. And you can't ever get anything from the outside if you can't speak with one voice. So we can't have the nurse executives being opposed to ratios if all the practicing nurses want it. That's the situation we have in the US. That's not strategic. So I don't know if that helps, but it's, you know, we just got to get better at that. Thanks. Thank you. I think, yeah. Yes. Hi, my name is Raj. I'm a student, nursing student at King's. I'm from Singapore, yeah. Um, just one, two questions. One question is, the first one is, most of us have ideas, um, as to where we, whether we have students or nurses in the wards to do research, but the moment we introduce statistics and any research-related knowledge, that kind of takes us aback and we get discouraged at times. How do you think we can pick the interest of students and nurses to be more inclined to do research and not just stop at having ideas and the next one is more of, can I take a picture with you at the end of this? Yeah, it's more of a request rather than a question. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Give, me, give me the retread out because I'm having trouble picking yes. it up over the mic. It's about student nurse engagement in research. How do they get experience as well as having ideas about research? How do you get into the game? Well, nursing education has to change, you know, really. I always say our hospitals have changed in some details, but they're the same as when I graduated 50 years ago. And I think we could say it's sometimes that about nursing education. And, you know, it should all be about from the very beginning asking questions and thinking about research from, you know, the, even from the very beginning. And, you know, I have, a, you know, two grandchildren there in nursing school. Okay, well, you know, they had a whole um, simulation lab on making a bed. I said, well, you don't have to go to university <laughs> to learn how to make a bed. And we're still kind of doing it. And so, and they say, well, you know, we go in the hospital and the nurses are not nice to us. And I say, well, why is that? And he said, well, you know, we're trying to learn how to do vital signs on their patients. I said, you know, come on, why don't you learn how to do vital signs on each other and then go in there. These nurses are really pressed and work with them and follow them and ask them what they're doing and ask them why they're doing it. I mean, we're not kind of setting up the learning things. And, and from these questions, then you get the ideas for research. And then you could kind of start 
kind of doing some research along. I mean, it doesn't have to be, you know, the greatest research ever, but, and then we have to take our researchers and we have to give the undergraduate starting at undergraduate level and they have to be linked with researchers. Yes, we're so like, again, this is something where our nurses in practice are not really always totally open to the idea <laughs> that research could really help things. And so nurses in practice and some of our clinical faculty are telling nurses, all you have to do is practice, practice. You don't have to do research. So this is, you know, we're not sort of, again, speaking with the same voice. So in my program, I think the reason I got interested in it is from the very beginning, it was kind of in the early days of nursing research, but it was all about evidence. It was about doing the nursing history and collecting evidence on why you get the nursing care plan out of the history that you took. Well, we're kind of missing that now. So right from the very beginning, research seems to be something different. But since that is what it is, then we have to have more ways to connect our undergraduate students with research. I mean, one simple way that I think helps in our context is we have these honors programs in a lot of our universities. Well, the honors program shouldn't just be a reward for smart people, it should connect them with the people that have funded research. So as part of being an honors student, they're, they have to spend time in research as well as clinical practice. So they appreciate, I mean, most researchers are excited about their research. So if students ever really saw the excitement of it, it's kind of catching. So we need to do more of melding these things together, practice and research and how they go together from the very beginning. Thanks. I'm Oh, yes, it was yourself and then Andreas, I think. Is there one up here as well? Okay. Hello, um, thank you so much for the talk. It was really um, inspiring and this really convinced me to definitely pursue research. Um, I'm Georgie, I'm a second year children's nursing student and I'm really interested about the disconnect between care provider organisations and governing bodies like Public Health England's relationship with the NHS and where policy can break down into being put into practice. And this is something I really want to have a look at. I was just wondering if you have any advice on how to look more in, into that relationship between those two organizations. It's about, it's, it's a local issue to some extent about public health, England and NHS. It's about fragmentation between different bodies. I mean, I suppose that's the essential kind of principle when you're having trying to have a comprehensive health plan. Of course, you've got many different bodies with different accountabilities and roles in trying to formulate that. But is your question really about trying to get Georgina away from the sort of hospital dominance, acute sector dominance of policy and out into public health? Is that? Yeah, it's also... Um... It's also sort of about understanding how people manage public health. So it's like looking at how, how my, the way I see it is how you have a health minister who's had no, um, never stepped into a hospital, but then is then suddenly responsible for all the actions of health organisations. And I was just wondering about how that structure can facilitate people who don't work in hospitals or have never worked in hospitals. And where does that bureaucracy of civil service and governance, how does that impact healthy outcomes within a hospital? So I think if I get the question, I mean, this, one of the big problems with healthcare is it's so fragmented into the settings and we have to have more models that bridge the settings. If settings are not going to change. You know, we keep thinking we can change things that, you know, are too difficult to change. So we probably have to have models. And so we have to have models that have research associated with it so you can uh, see if they work. So we have two models in the US that I think are <clears throat> really good models of this that kind of cross different sectors between social services and health services and so forth. One of them is called Transitional Care, developed by my colleague Mary Naylor. I don't know if you, 
you know, heard of her, but it's really her whole career, she's been working on a model for the U.S. system now. So every system was a little bit different as fragmentation, where nurse practitioners that are really community-based come into the hospital before the patient is discharged and are involved in the discharge and create the plan, and then the patients come into their practice. That is an intersectorial change in our system because our hospital system is really not connected very well with our community system, and it works. So she spent 40 years showing that you can improve all the patient outcomes if you do that, and that it saves money, and so now she's trying to drive it into the insurance system so the insurance will pay for it to cross these lines. Another one's called family health partners, uh, nurse family partnerships, where it's doing something that you already have in your system, but we don't, that sends nurses into the homes of new mothers, especially poor mm -hmm. mothers, on the assumption that if you can approve both the health of the mother and the baby at the time that the first baby is born, this is the time for learning all kinds of things. Yeah. It's kind of how you coach the mother to be able to return to work and how you give her some skills to multitask and how you take care of the baby and move that then into caregiving. So there's 40 years of research that's been done in a randomized trial in the US that shows that has worked. And so now it's being sold to government, so government's paying for it. But research is so important in those things. I mean, we all have ideas that we think will work, but we don't really test them in a way that gives the potential buyers and end users the confidence that if they do it, it would really work. So I think that's one of the ways that we have to, to do this. I mean, we could really throw out our whole health system and start again, but revolution is kind of hard mm -hmm. and it creates all these other things. So probably every system, even if it's a national health services like yours, is gonna be incremental change. So you have to kind of choose the targets that might make a difference, but have research be part of it and business case. Thank you, Linda. Okay, and one question then, Andreas, I think. Celia, final question, because I think we're going to have to wrap up, okay. unfortunately. Thank you so much, fascinating conversation. Um, I'm Anne Gallagher, Brunel University, London, and also editor of Nursing Ethics. So you might uh, predict this question. <laughs> Um, I just wonder how you think philosophical analysis and qualitative work can enhance survey research. Thank you. With it. Philosophical research and qualitative work, how can it enhance survey research? Uh, you're probably asking the wrong person because I'm a quant person. <laughs> and, you know, public policy is about numbers. It's usually about money, uh, but it's about numbers. and. I'm just, you know, I have a certain kind of appreciation for it, I guess. I think historic research is really fabulous because you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you came from. And, if, you know, that kind of fits into my policy realm. I guess I think combining quantitative research with qualitative research is enriching. I mean, especially if you did the qualitative research in advance so that you could shape the surveys to try to tap into what you found on the qualitative side. I don't really personally put a, I mean, I know this is heretical, sorry, apologize, uh, that in the world of policy, which is my area, I'm not sure qualitative research is all that helpful. Narratives in combination with numbers mm -hmm. are probably the most powerful thing. Like, you know, a lot of legislation in the U.S. is motivated by something that happened to one person. You know, a child that's healthy goes in the hospital and dies of sepsis unexpectedly, and then all of a sudden you have a policy. Mm -hmm. But to combine that then with numbers is very powerful. Mm -hmm. But that, see, that's kind of what I didn't like about PhD programs in nursing when I was starting out. They were all qualitative, and one story is one story, you know. <laughs> and quantitative research on a million patients is 
to me, you, you can take something else away from it. This is just an orientation. You know, we benefit from all kinds of research, but I fear that nurses often <clears throat> go into qualitative research because they're afraid of the math in the quantitative side, and they're just not willing to invest what it takes to be in that world, and we don't offer them enough opportunities in nursing school to develop those skills, which are just like clinical skills. I mean, it's hard to do some of these things in the ICU, but we make ourselves learn it. It's hard to do some of these quantitative things, too. So there are not enough nurses that have quantitative skills, and then everybody feels a lot of discomfort with it. So I, I'm not sure that's, this is from my heart uh, and from a long time as a researcher. So that's all I can say about it. <laughs> Thanks, that's, that's great, Linda. Andreas, I think you're next up with your question and then Celia's got the last word. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andreas. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer here in the Faculty of Nursing with very palliative care. I'm an NIHR advanced fellow and uh, the product of Anne-Marie's mentoring. <laughs> um, thank you so much, firstly, that was, that was fascinating to hear. One of the things you touched on was the quality of the working environment to recruit and to retain nurses, one aspect of which is interprofessional collaboration, uh, which you've both demonstrated as important. Um, but it's something we still struggle with to, to achieve consistently. Um, I wonder if you had any views, thoughts, or experiences on the issue of interprofessional collaboration and relationship with nurse staffing? See, the main part is about in, interprofessional. interprofessional collaboration that yeah. links with nurse staffing, but wrapped around the environmental drivers of that. Right. Well, what we find in our research is nothing works when you don't have enough staffing. And interprofessional collaboration works best when you have basic level of staffing. Otherwise, nobody has time to even talk to each other to do the collaboration. So we've looked at it, um, you know, quantitative work, and, and that's what we find. It's really, it's almost impossible to do anything good unless you have enough staffing. That's why I kind of kept moving more and more and more into staffing. It's just what we keep finding over and over again. Doctors and nurses and other people in healthcare, social workers, et cetera, they want to work together. You know, they like working together. Then, and a lot, what we're finding in our research is a lot of the hierarchical tension that nurses used to have with doctors. In the US, that's pretty much gone. I mean, one of the things that's working well in our US, it's, this is some of this is custom and different countries, you know, have different evolutions of this, but one of the good news things we find in all of our research is that from the point of view of doctors and nurses, the interdisciplinary collaboration is the best it's ever been. Because, you know, nurses are more educated than they've ever been before. They're talking the same language. Uh, we have, uh, in a study that Anne-Marie and I are doing in Europe, when we asked both doctors and nurses, what would be the most important interventions that your hospitals could do to reduce your own burnout, 86% of nurses said improve nurse staffing, but 45% of doctors said improve nurse staffing to reduce my burnout, my, my the doctor's burnout, mm -hmm. because they're all interconnected now. And so the work-life balance of physicians in hospitals is very dependent upon there being enough nurses there. If they're not, then, you know, their life is hell. And so they're realizing that now. And so that is working very well, but it's undermined if you don't have enough nurses there. Thank you. Celia, you're the, the, last, the last word. Thank you. Um, my name's Celia Manson, and I'm not sure that I really should be here this evening, but I was determined to come because I've followed your career and your work for a very long time and been absolutely fascinated by it. So thank you. It, it's been a great evening, and I have learned a tremendous amount I have many, many questions and no time to ask any of them, uh, but that's fine. Um, I've been a nurse since 1974, so 
you can tell I'm pretty ancient. Uh, but I am still working. And I think what you've left me with this evening, and I hope probably some of my colleagues in the audience, is you never stop learning, even if you're 71 or perhaps 81 or whatever, whatever. Um, you never stop learning and you still must ask the questions. So thank you very much indeed, Linda. Thank you, that's a wonderful like final statement because if I had thought of to say it myself, I couldn't have agreed more. Thank you so much. <laughs> Brilliant, well thanks Celia. I just want to add my thanks to, first of all, the people behind the scenes who've actually been helping to put this event together. Angela, you gonna stand up and give us a wee the bow, yeah, Angela, thank you. Bella in comms, you can't see it. Anika have also helped our fabulous assistants, Natalie and, and Andreas. Our tech staff, wow, you are you are our heroes and heroines. But most of all, Linda, I was just thinking we started with an avatar and I've now got a vision of a hologram in my head of <laughs> Florence Nightingale and you kind of alternating because this is very much in that tradition of, of her research. She would, she's beaming down watching us and she's saying, gotcha, good on you, good on you, Linda, keep going. Thank you so much, Linda, that was Thank fabulous. you, thank you so much. Thank you to you, to the audience. Great questions and wish everybody luck and congratulations on some of those new PhDs out there. <laughs> exactly. Thank you.